Thank you, Myron. Thank you, worship team. If you guys would open with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you that we were able to come here and worship you this morning. Pray that we would have ears to hear and hearts to receive as we dive into your word. And that we would all leave here closer to you and ready to bring glory to your name throughout this week. Amen. Good morning, church. Uh, yeah, I'm Davis. For those of you who don't know me, I a little backstory about myself. I've been traveling around the state the past few years. Right now I'm living in Darlington. I'm doing some courses online through Moody Bible Institute, working at First Baptist Church over there. I work with their youth. Been doing that for a few months now. Absolutely loving it. For those of you who do know me, you might be a little surprised to see me up here on a Sunday morning, and rightfully so. I grew up going to this church. I went to school about 20 yards that way. Uh, and growing up, I don't think I really lived a life that was quite mirroring that of Christ. So God definitely worked on me throughout the years. And last time I was here, I was asking you guys to partner with me with going to Australia. And I haven't been able to make it back since then, so update on that. We can talk about it more after the service as well. But that was amazing. Um, seeing the diversity over there and being able to learn about other people's cultures and also introduce some of them to the gospel for the first time was an absolutely amazing experience. So I thank you all for being with me in prayer and supporting me financially and just giving, the, giving me that base as I went out. So thank you again for that. Yeah, as, I, as, I, as I'm here on a Sunday morning, being able to give you guys this sermon, it's, I'm very grateful for that. And being in Philippians 3 this morning, I resonate with that story, with that passage quite a bit. So I'm excited to be able to share that with you guys this morning. So while, you're, while you guys are turning to Philippians 3, a little context on this book, this letter, is that it was written by Paul. And if you grew up going to church, Paul is a name that you have heard quite often, especially if you're in the New Testament, something that you hear quite a bit. But if you've never heard the name Paul, he is a person who is very influential in the spread of Christianity. He wasn't always there for, he wasn't always pushing Christianity. He was actually against it for a while. But at this point, towards the end of his life, he's only a few years away from death. He's been in ministry for about 30 years now. And he is writing to the Church of Philippi. And these are people that he is quite familiar with. This was on his second miss missionary journey, I believe, that he founded this church. So he was very close to these people. He's not writing to strangers. He's writing to people that he knows. And we'll start in verses 10 and 11. Kind of start towards the end of the passage, but we'll work our way back. We read, That I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the, re the resurrection of the dead. So we see here that Paul is saying that he is able to share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, obtain that resurrection, and that he is able to know God. He is able to have that relationship with God. But how, how do we get to that point of having that relationship with God? How do we come to know him? How do we have confidence that we will be spending eternity with him? And that is something that we'll be able to see as we read the rest of the passage. We see how Paul reflects on his life, the good things that he's done, the correct decisions that he's made. But we're also going to look at the decisions that he made before he found the truth and where he was placing his confidence. So as the title was, as you could see up there before, was where is your confidence? We're going to, we'll go back to verses 3 through 5. We read, For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, 
of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. We'll stop there for now. What he's trying to convey in these, in these verses is that our confidence is not in our heritage or our upbringing. He begins by saying that he was circumcised on the eighth day. He's saying this so people recognize that he was not somebody who came to Judaism, Judaism later in life. Rather, since he was, as we see, eight days old, his parents began raising him in Jewish tradition. So he's like, I've been around this my entire life. I didn't enter this just recently. I've always been in this. And he goes on to say that he is of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin. So he is of God's chosen people. And he is able to trace his lineage all the way back to Benjamin, meaning Jacob, Isaac, all the way to Abraham. Which at this point, a lot of people aren't able to do. They've lost that ability to trace their family line all the way back. And being Jewish and being able to trace trace your line all the way back to Abraham was very important to them for their religion. They're like, I can prove to you through my family line that I'm a Jew and I'm able to be in this religion. And he was also raised in the Jewish tradition. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. So he was taught Hebrew. He grew up in Tarsus, but he, his parents still had him. Learned this language, and he went through life in this certain way. And we see that his confidence is in his upbringing, or used to be in his upbringing, in his heritage. And sometimes we can fall into that today. Like as, I, as I'm here at Oak Hill, as I grew up here, there are families that are multi-generational, that still attend here at Oak Hill, which is an amazing thing. It's awesome to see grandparents with their children and their children's children here coming and worshiping God each week. That is an amazing thing. But just as my sister and I were raised in a Christian home with Christian morals, coming to church, going to a Christian school, sometimes that can add some false securities to where it's like, people began seeing your life and your family and how you were raised, and they just expect you to be a Christian. So you begin going through the motions, and you don't, you don't really go past that. You begin putting your confidence in how you've been raised, how you go about life, but you haven't truly made that decision for yourself. So we cannot put our confidence in our upbringing or the environment that, in which we were raised. Moreover, our confidence is not in our devotion. We see, as Paul says, as to zeal, in verse 6, he was a persecutor of the church. Zeal is a two-sided word, and it was something, it was an attribute that religious leaders would, they sought after this. Because it meant that you loved God so much that you would hate God whatever was against it. And at this time, Paul, who was Saul, hadn't quite made that conversion yet, saw this new group, these Christians, these followers of Jesus, and he thought that they were trying to pull people away from God. So he thought that he was doing something right. But I mean, for those of you who don't, who don't know the life of Saul, he, in Acts, I believe it's 7 and 8, we see Stephen. And he was a follower of Jesus, and he was preaching outside of the synagogues. And people didn't really like that he was preaching this gospel. And they ended up bringing false accusations against him. And he ended up getting brought in front of the high priest. And amazingly, he did not back down. He knew that what he was about to say was most likely going to get him killed. He wasn't going to be living too long after this. But he began preaching, and he gave a sermon. And at the end of it, his conclusion that these people were like their fathers and their fathers' fathers, that they were stiff-necked people, who these prophets, all these prophets that had come along, they would persecute them, they ignored them, they went against what they said. And then ended up taking Stephen out to kill him. And Paul was there. 
to hold their jackets and give them the okay to kill him. So sometimes it can be confusing for us because we might look at a non-believer's life and they could be devoted to taking care of their family, bettering the society that they're in, or just doing something that could that is good, that looks like it's good. But if what you're devoted to is not grounded in the truth of Christ, you cannot put your confidence in salvation in what you are doing. So your devotion, even if you're going about things in church here, if you're showing up here early, you're making the desserts for back there, the bakery items, if you're going out, you're volunteering at the men's shelter, you're going to the Man Society Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and you're doing all these things, you have to look at your heart posture through it. If you're doing it to where, you're like, okay, I've done all of these good things, and like, I really want to do it, I want to do it, but it's so that you can gain your salvation. It's not something that you can put your confidence in. You're beginning to turn into a works-based faith. It's where because I'm doing all these good things, therefore I'm in right standing with God. So it's not by your devotion of doing these things that you're able to come to know Christ. Likewise, at the end of verses 5 and at the end of verse 6, he says, As to the law, a Pharisee, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. When it came to his knowledge of the law because of his upbringing, the way he was raised, and then deciding to be, as we see, a Pharisee, he was very knowledgeable in old law. A Pharisee was an extremely strict Jewish group with an extensive knowledge of the law. And not only was he good at keeping up with atoning for the, if he did commit wrong, he'd be quick to offer up a sacrifice to where he would be seen as innocent. But these people are actually pretty good at following the old law. So he says, as to the old law, I'll be considered blameless. But he doesn't see this as something to where he can put his confidence in that. I think that's trying to become, become bl blameless is something that I struggled with and I think quite a few might struggle with. Because when you think of Christians, usually one doesn't think of someone who is, just, who is a broken person, who still commits sin. Usually, like, non-believers see See them as like, oh, okay, so a Christian is someone who doesn't do wrong. And that was the mindset that I had before I became a believer. And I was trying to rid myself of all of these sins before I could come to know God. And that's just, when you think about it, it doesn't make any sense. Because how, so you want to come to know Christ, and the way that you do that is that, so one of the first steps is to re repent of your sins. So why are you trying to fix all of these sins, escape all of these sins, all of those temptations, and then come to God? Being like, okay, now, now I can come to you. I was, so at the time, I was not a Christian. I, I've only been a Christian now for a couple of years. And I was trying to figure out ways to get out of these sins by my own power. And if anybody has tried that, and I'm sure if I asked all of you to raise your hands, if you've ever tried to get out of these sins or these temptations by yourself, I'm sure everybody would raise their hand. And all of you would know that it's not possible. Sure, you, you might be able to get out of those temptations. If you had addictions, maybe you could escape that for a few days. But you're going to end up falling right back into that. And I would keep falling back into these temptations. And I would just be filled with doubt. I would ever be, be able to escape this. But one thing that I knew is that you should be going to church. I was like, okay, if, I go, like if I'm going to church, like at least then I'll be surrounded with people 
and like God's word to where maybe I'll, I'll figure this thing out. And by the grace of God, one of the messages that I did hear finally clicked with my brain. I was at Bethel, I was visiting the church, and it wasn't even his main point. I think it was just some rant that he went on for a little bit. But he ended up saying that Jesus doesn't want you to be perfect before you come to him. He doesn't expect you to be blameless. He doesn't expect you to rise out of these sins on your own power. And then once you're spotless, once you get rid of these big sins, and once you're just, once you just have these, then you can come to me. Then I'll give you some help. That's not what he's looking for. And it took, it took a while for me to realize that, which is why I'm thankful that I'm able to be here with you guys this morning. And I'm, maybe nobody needed to hear that. Maybe somebody did. But Jesus doesn't want you to be perfect before you come to him. He wants to meet you where you are at. He wants to help lift you out of that sin so you can become closer with him. So our confidence is not in our good works. This leads to my final point, which is what Paul is emphasizing in this passage. I look at verses 7 to 9. It says, But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes from faith, that, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Paul isn't saying that all of these things that he just listed is less compared to knowing Christ. He says that they are rubbish. Rubbish is, it means, if you look at it, it means fecal matter. All right? So he's not saying like, oh, like it, it just means, like it's, it's still like kind of important, but like we really need to look at, we need to look at Jesus. No, this is worthless. This is absolute trash compared to knowing Christ. It says here, having a righteousness, sorry, lost my place, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. I'm going to keep coming back to, back to it. When I read this, I just keep wondering why do we continue to try and work for our faith, work for our salvation. It just doesn't make any sense. If God is giving us this free gift gift of righteousness by grace, why don't we accept that? Why don't we put our confidence in that? Why don't we put our confidence in Christ through what he did on that cross? We see in Romans 6, 4, that we were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So when Jesus came to earth, fully God, fully human, he lived a perfect life free of sin. And it wasn't a life to where he was hiding up in a tower until he was 30 years old, and then he started his ministry, and that's when the world first began to see him. He lived a life that would have been similar to those around him, and he faced all the temptations that we face, but he was able to resist those temptations and remain truly blameless. There was no sin in his life, making him the perfect sacrifice to where when he was on the cross, he took the weight of our sins upon him. And as it says in Romans 6, 4, that when he was buried and when he was risen, 
that we were able to rise with him as new creations. Our sins are forgiven through that. And we can put our faith in him and have confidence that we are going to spend eternity with the Father. I'd like to close. Might be running a little short. I don't know how long I've been up here quite yet. But I would like to leave leave you guys with a question. That is, have you found right standing with God through faith in Christ? Or are you placing your confidence in the flesh? I don't want you guys to truly think about that. Today, throughout this upcoming week, throughout your entire life, because there may be areas where you haven't completely surrendered that to God. And I want you to think about if you are completely dependent on Christ. Are you doing these things on the side as a backup plan to where, okay, like I believe in Jesus, I believe what he did, but just in case it didn't, didn't quite work out the way it says in the Bible, I have these things just as a little fallback. Are there areas like that in your life? Are you completely dependent on Christ and what he did? I'm not saying that you shouldn't be doing these things, these good things, learning about God, raising your kids in an environment, in a good environment. But are you doing that to bring glory to God, or are you doing that to feel safe, that just in case what Christ did wasn't enough? So I'd like to invite the worship team back up here, and I will close this in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you that thank you again that we were able to be here this morning. I thank you that I was able to have the opportunity to come speak here. And I pray that we commit all of our confidence to you and what you did on the cross that you paid the price for our sins, and nothing that we can do will atone for all of our sins. When we place our faith in you, that is all we need. All we need is you, Christ. Pray that as we go out this week, that we will bring glory to your name. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.